Hey everyone, we finally made it to the end of 2021 and now we're about to start a new year, 2022. So in this video, I thought I would share with you all what my favorite book was that I read in 2021. That book is How to Not Die Alone, The Surprising Science of How to Find Love. And this was written by Logan Uri, who is actually a relationship scientist at the popular dating app Hinge. In this video, I wanted to share with you all a summary of all the main points she hits in the books in case you aren't able to read it. But I do highly recommend that you go out and actually get the book and read it because she goes into very deep explanation and history behind why she suggests doing these different things. And I personally wanted to share what I learned in this book because for me this book really like changed my outlook on dating and life in general and relationships. I was like do I suck at dating? I can't do this anymore. How many more first days do I have to go on? Should I keep dating? Should I give up? Should I just decide to die alone? I don't know. But that's how this book. It was like okay hope is restored. That's it. I'm gonna read this. Hopefully there's some good nuggets and after reading it went on like a hardcore rampage of like lots of hinge dates because I was trying to use some of her methods which I will give some reviews on later of some that worked and didn't work and some tips and tricks along them. So without further ado, let's jump into the main points of this book. In this book, she's actually split it into three parts. The first part is getting ready. So getting ready to get back out there and dating. The second part is getting out there. So now you're ready to date and you've done a preparation. Now you need to go on the actual date. And then finally, the third part is getting serious. So now you're ready to either break up or get together and take the next step, get married, etc. So she kind of talks about building that long-term relationship. So let's start with the first section, which is getting ready to go out there and date. So she starts off the book by and talking about five different reasons why dating seems so much harder in this day and age. So the first reason is that we can choose our own destinies. Back in the day, a lot of times, and still in some places today, your parents will choose who you're gonna marry or you just marry who's ever next to you because you don't really have any other way to meet anybody else because travel, internet, etc. wasn't there. Planes and such weren't there. So she explains we have lots of freedom to choose our own identity and choose who we want to be with. And so this can make it difficult because obviously there are so many choices, which is her second point. There are so many options right there. We get to choose which option that we go with. And so having so many decisions can be hard because there's just so many potential matches that you might be with that sometimes it can mess you up when you're like, oh, is this the one I want to be with and make my life with? Or maybe there's something better out there. So it's really hard in that sense as well. Number three is that we all are yearning for certainty. It's hard when you really want to be right. You want to pick that right option. You want to feel like you are certain this is the one you're going to marry and you're not going to have to divorce or break up or have anything terrible happen. Obviously nobody wants that. But when we really want that certainty in this world where nothing is really that certain, it can really hinder us when we're trying to find a relationship if we're trying to find that perfect one or we think someone we're gonna feel 100% certain about but you really can't predict and I totally agree with that sentiment as some people have had those relationships where you think you're gonna last forever and then you do not last forever and that just like makes you have to change your whole idea of the future. The fourth thing she said which makes it hard to date in this world is social comparison and so obviously comparison is really tricky not to do it's just our brains just do that so it's really hard to fight it and when we compare ourselves especially on social media these days and media in general they show all these couples who are super happy, super fit, super attractive, like showing that you're with a perfect partner. But in reality, you know, you're obviously just seeing the highlight reel. You're not seeing the actual struggles that they're going through. And so it can be hard to feel like, oh, like I want what they have. I wish I had a partner that did X, Y, Z. Why can't I find the perfect partner? So it can lead to lots of thoughts like that, which can be derailing when you're trying to find somebody. And then kind of going off of that, she says that the fifth thing is that we, a lot of us don't have really good examples of what a healthy relationship looks like. Like I myself have seen lots of media and have fallen for the idea that oh, I really want that like bad boy who like only cares about me but it's like uh no <laughs> like that's not good you don't want someone who's mean to everyone but you because they're probably gonna be mean to you eventually and also just being mean to everyone is not a good sign <laughs> like that's not hot but like lots of media shows that and then they show lots of celebrities who like get together and divorce right away it's just hard to find a good relationship example if you're lucky maybe your parents will have modeled a really good relationship for you but it's tricky so in the next section of getting ready she then talks about three dating blind spots that people have that she's identified over her research and so the three dating blind spots are the maximum the romantic and the hesitator. So she actually has a whole quiz that you can take and figure out which one you are and so let me explain a little bit of each of them and then I'll tell you what my score was. So the first dating blind spot is the maximizer. The maximizer is somebody who really wants to maximize everything they do. They're not satisfiers. Maximizers will spend two to three hours trying to decide on something like a new coffee machine and the satisfier might spend like 30 minutes but they make a choice that's good enough and they're okay with something that's good enough and they're super happy with their choice. A maximizer might spend two hours and then buy it and then feel remorse and wonder if they got the best one or not and so in that way satisfiers are actually end up being happier than maximizers because maybe they didn't get the best coffee machine that's out there 
but they're satisfied with the one that they picked. They know it's good enough, it's gonna do the job they want, and they're very happy. And this is not to say that these are people that need to settle or anything, it's just saying that a lot of times maximizers when they're dating can get in their head because they'll think, oh no, there's something better out there, but I'm with this person I like a lot and who makes me happy, but maybe there's someone who can make me just a tiny bit happier. So that's the explanation for the blind spot of a maximizer. The next dating blind spot is the romantic. So the romantic has these fairy tale expectations. They believe in this idea that there's this perfect one soulmate out there for them who will like check off every single box they have, who's gonna be like their knight in shining armor. Like it's gonna be incredible. They're gonna feel some awesome spark. But she says this is obviously a blind spot as sometimes you don't feel that spark right away. And it's very unlikely that you're gonna find someone who's perfect for you and just know right away. And these people get in their own way because they tend to date and then and they'll realize well you don't like fit this one characteristic maybe you don't have brown hair or whatever like okay bye like i can't be with you or something like that because they think they'll find someone who is going to be that perfect soulmate and so for these people they really need to remember that we all have flaws nobody's perfect you're not going to find someone who's that perfect match and perfect person that's impossible so it's really trying to figure out what is really important to you when you're in a relationship so the third blind spot is the hesitator. So the hesitator feels like they don't want to date until they're 100% ready. Maybe they say stuff like, well, if I get my perfect body or if I get that perfect job or if I just do a little more school, then I'll be ready to go out and date. And so these people are really hesitant, as the name says. They don't want to go on dates until they feel like they are 100% ready. But obviously, if you don't take any chances, then you're not going to find anyone to date if you don't go out there and actually ever try to talk to anybody. And another issue with the hesitator is that you also are missing out on some practice like you know dating takes practice it's a skill to talk to people on dates one-on-one -on -one. and so if you don't just go out there and stumble a little bit then you're never gonna get that practice and so she really talks about how it's really important for hesitators to just get out there and try not to overthink and so those are obviously very big simplifications of those three blind spots that she mentioned she does a great job explaining it in more detail in the book and so she has a quiz in there it's like 10 questions and it'll help you identify which one you are so i took the quiz right here i did it on a little piece of paper and then i found that i was 12 points for the maximizer 11 points for the romantic and finally eight points for the hesitator and that sounds a little high for hesitating because i feel like i don't really feel like i'm the hesitator but overall i pretty much agree with that i think when i read the maximizer i'm like oh that is definitely me i'm always like well i wonder if there's something better out there and then that kind of goes along with the romantic like well they're not my perfect person they're missing this characteristic or trait which i feel like i would really like and so i feel like it's really telling that my blind spots are the romantic and the maximizer so going forward that was really helpful for me when i'm now evaluating and going on dates like thinking about oh like is this actually a problem or is this just my maximizer or romantic tendency coming out right now so in the second part she talks about getting out there now it is time for you to go on that date what are some tips to help you with that so the first thing she covers is attachment style i've heard a lot of my friends personally talk about it and try to understand what is your attachment style because it can help you figure out how you behave and what you look for in different types of relationship and especially in your love relationship i think it's really helpful for you and your partner to know what your attachment style is so you can know what triggers you and also how to work on improving and getting better on managing your attachment style and so i'm going to go over an extremely brief overview but obviously there's whole books written on this in youtube videos which i'll link below so the first attachment style is secure and when you have a secure attachment style you are very comfortable with conflict and resolving conflict and working with the other person you're very comfortable being intimate with them as well as comfortable in your own space away from your partner the next one is an avoidant attachment style and when you have an avoidant attachment style you are very self-reliant and you tend to downplay how important relationships are like oh you know whatever it's not that important to me and you're also can be very distant in relationships because you're afraid of that intimacy and getting hurt and you want to avoid that the third attachment style is the anxious attachment style and so in the anxious attachment style you are overly concerned with the relationship you feel like you need to be really close to them at all times and you worry that they may not like you or leave at some point you are also maybe dependent on them for self-worth and you really want the other person's approval finally there is the fearful attachment style and this one kind of combines both anxious and avoidant so you're very afraid of them leaving but you also don't want to get too attached and the fearful attachment style is a mix of avoidant and anxious so you're very dependent on the person but at the same time you try to stay distance because you don't want to get hurt and you're scared of being intimate because you think you'll get hurt in the future you also have a high attachment anxiety and you lack trust in them and so those are a quick summary of the four attachment styles i will say and learning about them more and taking lots of quizzes online i have discovered that i definitely have a mix of secure and anxious attachments style so sometimes I can be like you know pretty good at making conversations and feeling good in who I am without them and with them but also I know that I do have some more tendencies that lead more toward 
anxious attachment style where I'm very worried that someone might leave or that I really need them to like me which can cause problems in the relationship so this is, is very good to know for me as I go forward in relationship well one I can tell my future partner this is where I'm at and then we can also work together to figure out what theirs is and how we can work together to work on improving our attachment styles into that nice secure relationship and Logan goes into more detail in the book about how each attachment style might show up in a relationship and how it might affect who you choose to date and why you're having so much trouble dating. Sorry, I just had to change positions there because I was on my knees and they were high key falling asleep and it was really painful as all the blood was like not going towards them. So in the next section of getting out there, he then talks about how a lot of times we often go for the prom date rather than the life partner. This one hit really hard for me. I was like, oof, oof, oof. This was me that spoke to me a lot. So what do we mean by that? So the main message she wanted to get across in dating a life partner instead of a prom date is that oftentimes we don't really know what we want. We think we want someone who has lots of money, who is very attractive who has similar hobbies as well as similar interests and does a lot of the same activities that we do. However, all this stuff is actually indicative of a prom date if you go for all of those things. And she explains that what we really want in terms of long-term relationship are qualities such as we know how to handle conflict, they bring out the best in you, they're loyal, they are emotionally stable, they are very kind. And so I think that a lot of times she explains that people tend to underestimate how important those are, especially in contrast with the other things like attractiveness and money, etc. And I will say, you know, personally, I've totally fallen into this trap. I think I knew that some people I've dated, they may not have been the best at handling conflict with the style that I like to handle conflict in, but they were really attractive. They were fun. I was like, we have lots of similar interests. So I thought it would be fine. Like I thought we could make it work. But unfortunately, it's just a lot of the prompted qualities were there for us and we weren't able to work through it so I was like wow I'm realizing a lot of things about my past dating now that makes sense I was totally going for prom dates and it's like dang I need to go for that life partner so now going forward I am definitely looking for those other qualities such as we can handle conflict together and grow together on that note of like really focusing on these things that don't matter like attractiveness he was talking about how a lot of times on the dating apps they kind of force us to look at things that don't matter as much because it's the only thing you can tell you know you can put on your height you can enter in pictures of what you look like it's really hard to get a sense of who they are and things like loyalty, kindness, etc. just from a profile. And so she stresses that it's important to really get out and meet people as soon as you can. Obviously, like do it within a safe reason, like okay, get to know a little bit of them, but then try to go on that in-person date because it's really hard to tell things over text. Unless there is a big red flag in texting that maybe you don't want to go on a date with them. But that's something that I've really tried in my dating right after I read the book. I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me just talk to someone for like two or three messages back and forth and then boom, I'm just going to ask them to meet in person because I don't really know what they're like in text like some people come off really awkward in text but then in person they're really awesome so i'm like okay and vice versa it's happened where someone turns out really cool in text but in person you're just not feeling it so like let me just try to go on dates and just try and message them right away to me if i think i'm just a little bit interested so i did that but it led to a lot of really terrible dates like so i'm like okay maybe that's not the move i don't know you might want to talk to them a bit longer but personally that was just my experience but i do think it's important to eventually go on the date because i know from talking to people on online dating that everyone's just really tired of just texting back and forth forever and then never actually meeting up because eventually if you want to date them you are gonna have to meet up in person. On that note of meeting people in person, if you would rather not use apps and just meet in person, that's totally fine. She suggests some different ways you can do that. Some really awesome ways you can do that are going to places where you might have a similar interest and something to talk about and also some place that induces conversation. So for example, you can't really hit on someone in a movie theater because they're already in the theater and you're not gonna talk to anyone there. But say if you went to a concert or you went to a cooking class or a volunteer opportunity, it's great because you can meet lots of new people who are interested in that thing that you're interested in. And then you can also make conversation that like if you're doing a cooking class sitting next to someone you'd be like hey like you know how long you've been cooking how'd you find this class so doing those things can also help you find people in person if you don't want to use the apps or you want to supplement the apps with also going out to places where you can meet people IRL so now we move into the getting out there section of dating so now that you're on the date and maybe you've had the first date she said there are three things that you need to consider so the first thing you need to consider is that dating should not feel like a job interview which I am totally guilty of doing I know I have like a question list of things that I try to cover when I go on dates and sometimes I am just like, well, I'm gonna evaluate this person. Like, what do they hit? What are their like job? What are their views on XYZ? Things like that. It's like, I go out and I have this mindset of like, you know, I'm gonna evaluate how they respond to different things. And it's like, that's not fun. Like she was like, and your date shouldn't feel like a job interview for you or the other person. She said, to combat this, really focus on just 
having fun, getting to know someone, just seeing if you even think they're cool as a person that you want to spend more time with. The environment of the date really matters. So she gave an example of someone who went on a date, even though they were like in a hurry and needed to get to a work thing. So they scheduled a coffee and you know, he was rushed the whole time. He wasn't really feeling it. Of course he didn't feel really good about the date, but it's like, it's hard to feel good when you're just at a coffee shop. You know, you have to leave in like 30 minutes. You're like looking at your clock. So she opts for picking things that are really fun, you know, maybe like a picnic or going to an arcade, etc. Something where you can both just enjoy each other's time and get to know each other. She also suggests doing like some sort of pre-date ritual to get in the right mindset. Cause obviously if you come to the mindset of not really feeling it or in the zone, it won't give optimal chance for you all to get to meet each other. So you know, when you're in a down blue headspace, you're not feeling it, you're obviously probably whoever you meet at the time is just gonna be meh. But if you're really in the zone, you're gonna be like, woo. So like for me, I like to like play music already, like get in the zone, be like, you know, there's hope, this could go really well. I'm excited to go have fun with this new person and get to know them. So that's kind of the ritual that I do. Also, I think I wanted to include this because it was really helpful for me. Sometimes like it's hard for me to know, like how do I know if I wanna go on a second date? Well, she had post date eight. So these are eight questions that you can ask yourself after the date to kind of evaluate how you feel about it and how you felt about that person. So the eight questions are, what side of me did they bring out? How did my body feel during the date? Stiff or relaxed? Do I feel more energized or de-energized after the date? Is there something more about them that I'm curious about? Did they make me laugh? Did I feel heard when I spoke with them? Did I feel attractive in their presence? Did I feel captivated or bored during the date or somewhere in between? The second thing she wants you to consider while dating is to forget the myth of the spark. She says, F the spark straight up. She says that the spark is a myth. Sometimes there are people who you meet and you might not have an immediate spark right away, but it's more of a slow burn. What she says you want to opt going for like the slow burn because there are a lot of myths surrounding the spark, which she says are not true. The first one is that you're not always going to feel fireworks when you first meet like the love of your life. Like sometimes they're just someone you think is really cool or even just an acquaintance or a friend. Like you know, when you literally just met them. So you're like, oh, I don't know much about them. But chances are you're not going to feel some fiery spark. She also says there's this thing called the exposure effect where as you get to talk to someone more and get to know them more, the more exposed to them, the more familiar they become and the more feelings you'll have towards them which is also why a lot of times you might like someone who's in your a lot of your classes at school or your next door neighbor who you see all the time another myth is that the spark is always good like the spark can be real bad sometimes it's just based on like attractiveness like dang they're super hot and i feel this attractive spark but really you're just like oh i just get that feeling when someone's really attractive and you get nervous and so you think that's a spark but really it just means you're really attracted to them is all and some people are really charismatic so they're good at making you feel the spark like you think there's a spark but really that's just them being really charming and stuff but the spark whether it's there or not does not indicate whether a relationship is going to be long-term viable or not and i totally agree with this even though i totally fell for that spark myth as well like oh as being a romantic i totally was like oh well, i don't feel the spark right away like i feel like i just know after like the first date if i want to like be a boyfriend girlfriend with them but honestly it was just like i just know if i want to do them right off the bat like on the first date or not that's all it was and i think like it just happens sometimes where someone who you might not expect who's like been your friend for a while like you end up liking them and it's like wait what oh like you did not even think of them at all like that at the beginning and then like later i've heard like people are like wait oh like you're kind of kind of cool like should we try dating like i don't know but i've seen that happen with a lot of my friends so it's definitely possible to do that slow burn finally the last tip she has when going out on the date is try to opt for a second date make it a default it's really hard to know who the heck someone is from one date i mean unless they make the person like super well known and you are absolutely sure like oh no that didn't vibe like you don't have the same vibes as me this ain't gonna fly like you should opt to try to go for a second date she says to try to say a couple positive things about each person after a date rather than just focusing on the negative which is what people tend to do i do that as well and so try to think of the positives that you liked about them and just think about whether you'd want to just get to know them a little bit more if you're still kind of curious or interested about them it is important important to try to distinguish between a pet peeve versus an actual deal breaker. So a lot of people will say like, oh, it's a pet peeve, doesn't watch Gossip Girl. But you know, something like that, or like it's a pet peeve that they don't like eggs. Which for me, I'm actually like, that's kind of a deal breaker because I love eggs, so. <laughs> like hello like we can't eat eggs together okay like so anyway though but who knows uh, honestly if i found someone i really loved and they didn't like eggs i'd probably be okay so that's an example of yes that would probably fall into peeve even though my mind i'm kind of low-key like that's a deal breaker so i was trying to decide which ones really are a deal breaker and a pet peeve for you and finally she does say that she hates ghosting she's not a fan of it she thinks it's really hurtful and painful you should never ghost you should always have some sort of message to them because people could take it and personally i feel mixed because sometimes i think ghosting is like whatever if you only went on like one date and maybe like it wasn't really that great and it's fine you might never see them again it's like 
probably fine like sometimes it's just easier like maybe for both of you like sometimes i'm like oh i would like prefer someone just to talk to me i get the message it's basically the same as saying i don't want to talk to you it's like yeah that's why i'm not mad but say you went on a couple of dates and you actually built that relationship then i think you definitely should be like yo i don't want to like hang out with you like that so cool but i think in this day and age like if there's one day they don't respond then then probably don't like you so okay <laughs> yeah move on concludes the end of the getting out there section and then the last section she talks about getting serious there are many important stages in a relationship there's like defining the relationship there's deciding to move in you know get married etc all these milestones where you decide what you want to do with your relationship she says it's important not just let your relationship happen like just let it slide through like should we just move in i get we just kind of moved in together like you need to talk and decide that you want to go forward with this relationship because then you'll just kind of be on autopilot just letting things happen to you both without both intentionally choosing to decide to be together and take the next step and so after covering that she then talks about how you need to be intentional and then at these different like life moments with your partner you'll need to decide whether you want to keep going or end the relationship so in the next section she talks about two types of people and relationships and so she talks about hitchers and she explains ditchers both which can be harmful as one is staying too long the hitchers and one is leaving too early which are the ditchers and both hitching and ditching is harmful for both you and your partner because you're doing a disservice to both you and your partner by either staying in a relationship too long or leaving before you i really had a chance to grow when you all could have been something ditchers think that they could find something better They're scared that maybe it's not gonna work out and so they just get up and leave before a relationship is really ready even though you really like them and they really liked you and it could have been a long-term relationship and so for these ditchers you really need to think about is this really not working out or is it just because i'm scared etc i've actually had that in other parts of my life not just relationships like when i was deciding whether to move to new york and get a job i was really wanted to leave just because i was really scared and i didn't think i could do it and then my cousin said are you doing this because you actually don't want the job or you're just scared and so i think that is a lot of why ditchers leave they're scared they think they'll find something better they think it might not work out even though it actually did work out great and i was so happy that i stayed in new york and got the job similarly people who are in a relationship who are ditchers who actually decide to stay and pick someone can become really happy if they've made that right choice and want to put in the effort and work to make it work with someone who actually is a really great match for them on the other side you have the hitchers which stay too long which i will say <laughs> i feel attacked i'm <laughs> reading this like oh god like that is me like when you stay in a relationship too long because you're either afraid of hurting that person maybe you think that you can make it work even though there's some part inside of you saying it's really not going to work no matter what you know there's a myriad of reasons that you might stay in a relationship you're obviously going to miss them and all that stuff and obviously it doesn't really help you or that person because you don't actually love that person or think you can love them the way they want to be loved or the way you need to be loved and so you're just staying in this relationship wasting their time and your time when you could both be out there looking for other people who would be a more viable match i know sometimes it's hard because when you're in it you're like i can fix this like i can make it work but honestly sometimes it's just better when you know it's time to go and you don't think it's gonna work it's best to discuss it talk about it and then leave after that and then end off the relationship but obviously it's really hard as i have done that so <laughs> It is really tricky and then she talks a lot about breaking up and how to break up with someone as you know people in school don't teach you how the heck to break up with someone which is actually very important because i've heard of some atrocious breakup stories and even some of mine have not been the best and even my own breakups i assume maybe i've done it in ways that could have been better so we really need to be taught this but we don't so she says here is how you break up and here is a plan to reframe the breakup in your mind she says you really need to have a plan you need to plan out what you want to say the main points you want to hit you need to have a plan for what you and your partner are going to do after you break up you need to have a plan for what you want to do after you break up so you can start rewiring your brain and start focusing on yourself doing all that good stuff and trying to reframe things she has uh, really great steps in there that kind of go over the different things you can do to plan out your actual breakup she also says what i don't agree with this she says absolutely no friends with your exes I do agree it's hard and you both have to be super mature and be able to discuss things as you go through life but i think it's possible i've heard of people who have been friends with their exes because you were of course very close at one point and sometimes it just doesn't work that way but you can work out as friends so i think it's fine but definitely at the beginning i think it's helpful to have like a cutoff of like a couple months so you can both just like focus on yourselves reframe the breakup try to heal and you know heal the wounds let time do its thing and not think about them or get that like pleasure spark that happens when someone texts you and you're like oh i really like that oh my gosh so it's helpful to have a little bit of a cold turkey for a little bit before you even have that discussion of being friends so then she goes in the opposite direction now that we talked about breaking up is like what happens when you want to take the next step what about when you're ready for marriage she suggests that you actually answer a bunch of questions together what she listed in the book to help you all figure out if it is the right choice for you two to get married and to really get to know each other really really deeply as you're discussing whether getting married is right for you both and she finally ends this section by talking about intentional love and this is where again you are intentional about who you're with who you're making decisions with 
what kind of decisions you two are making together and just being intentional about picking the person you want to make it work with and she says that we all evolve change and grow of course and so you want someone that's going to change with you and evolve and grow with you finally at the end of the book this is my favorite resource she actually has a relationship contract and so it's a contract that kind of lists out how often you're all going to have sex together like how much time do you want alone how much time do you want with friends other things like that which are really important to talk about in a relationship i wish i had these with my past boyfriends so that we could have discussed and talked about like oh we're gonna check in we agree to check in every week or something at this time and figure out like how we're doing just see how you're feeling about the relationship obviously you don't have to do it every week maybe it's every month whatever works for you all and this may change throughout the years together but it's just really awesome because it's like i didn't even think of all these things and it would have been really helpful if i had before we got into a relationship or at the beginning so we could have plans in place to check in kind of like how we had roommate agreements when you're in college sometimes they make you do that where you do talk about like okay who's gonna get time alone at their room this time what's gonna happen if someone uh goes to sleep at this hour or too late so it's just really awesome i think to have this contract because personally for me i like pieces of paper <laughs> i like plans they make me feel like there's some sense of like control and knowing that okay next week we're gonna discuss me if i have an issue i want to bring up i can bring it up and we're both ready in the mindset for that time to work together at this relationship because it takes work <laughs> obviously you both have to put in work and grow together and it'll be tough but hopefully with a contract like this you can have set times where you can discuss these tough issues and also just think about happy times like wow we're doing really good so i kind of like really like the idea of that relationship contract so i highly recommend you get the book so you can get your hands on that relationship contract Thank you all so much for getting to the end of this video. I sincerely hope that some of these tips will help you in your dating life. I wish you all the best of luck with dating in 2022. I'll be out there with you. Please like this video if you found it helpful and subscribe and ring the bell for new videos coming in 2022. Um, we can all be on this wild dating adventure together. <laughs> Please leave a comment below if you have any dating advice that you'd love to share or any of these tips stood out for you or that you're excited to use. I would love to hear your tips or how your dates have been. Thank you so much and have a great 2022. I'll see y'all soon. Bye.